channel, I'm Jordan with Big Boy Toys. Hi, and I'm Stephanie. And today is our towing video. Yay, a towing video. Yay, our towing video. <laughs> so we're going to go over a lot of different apps. Don't do that. I told you don't do that, Jordan. Don't go like this, because it looks stupid. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Jordan with Big Boy Toys. Hi, and I'm Stephanie. And today is our towing video. Woohoo, a towing video. That's right, guys. So we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different aspects of towing with this video. Uh, the first thing that we'll talk about is the truck that's here behind me. It's a 2020 Ford F-250 with a 7.3 liter gas motor in it, which was all new for 2020. It also has a 10-speed transmission in it, which was all new for 2020. And also these four trimmers, uh, gas models with a 7.3 come standard with the uh, 430 rear differential in it. And then I'll talk a little bit about the trailer that we're going to be towing, which is our Grand Design 29 TBS. Yeah, and then we'll talk a little bit about the preparation that we, that we do prior to our departure, things like what we put in a truck, what we take with us, and how we set the truck up to the, or how we put the, the trailer onto the truck. We do have a weight distribution hitch, so we'll show you how we hook that thing up. Um, and then we're gonna be departing from Tucson, Arizona, or actually we're in Vell, Arizona, which is about 20 miles outside of Tucson, and we'll be going from uh, Vell, Arizona to Flagstaff, Arizona, which is about a 300 mile trip. And while we go up there, it's going to get pretty hot um, going through the Phoenix area. Um, and I'll be monitoring the, the temperature in the truck, which is when I talk about temperature, I'm going to talk about engine temperatures. I'm going to talk about transmission temperatures. I'm going to talk about RPM so you can see where the truck is, is hanging out in its gears and the RPM. And if it's struggling or not from Phoenix to Flagstaff is pretty much an all uphill uh, trip so that'll be really good for you guys to see and then miles per gallon I know a lot of you like a lot of you guys like the miles per gallon to see you know what I'm getting um, the last video I did I did a towing video and a lot of you commented on how the uh, truck calculator the truck MPG calculator was not that accurate and you wanted to see a um, hand calculation so in this trip I will be doing that hand calculation so that will give you the most accurate miles per gallon um, on pretty much a long haul trip 300 miles yeah, guys, so as Jordan mentioned, it's going to be a really hot one. It's going to be over 100 degrees going all the way up there and about 110 going through the Phoenix area. Yeah, so thanks for coming along with us on our trip, guys. So yeah, yeah let's, let's get, get started. started. All right, guys, so here we go. This is my 2020 Ford F-250 trimmer. You know what, guys? I think a truck of this caliber deserves a proper intro. Let's do it. All right, I think that was much better. All right, so let's talk about this truck a little bit. This is my 2020 Ford F-250 trimmer, 7.3, and I could go into everything that a trimmer is, um, but it's been out long enough that I'm sure most of you that are interested in them or know about them have already read enough on the internet, uh, so I won't go into a whole lot about what the trimmer package is, other than um, it does have the 35-inch tires on it, which is really nice. Uh, this one, like I said, has a 7.3 liter gas in it. But one of the things that I want to talk about is, so this is the F-250 Lariat. And one of the cool things with these trimmer packages is that the F-250 and the F-350 are the exact same truck. And when I say the exact same truck, I mean the exact same truck. They got the same leaf packs, the uh, transmission, the axles, everything is the same and the reason is is that these trimmers basically come with a high capacity towing package factory or standard now in a regular 250 and a 350 you are going to have some differences um, and one of them is going to be let me show you down here so again this is a 250 and if you come down here to my rear leaf packs you'll see i've got this overload spring and i got one two three four leaf springs and a normal 250 
A lot of them don't come with this overload. They just come with these down here. The 350s all come with this overload uh, pack up here. And you might wonder, well, why, why go with an F-250 over an F-350? So in Arizona, um, one ton trucks or F-350s and above, they make you register your vehicle as a commercial vehicle. And when they do that, you have to pay, pay uh, higher registration fees. You have to abide by all the DOT uh, regulations. Um, basically, all the Arizona State Troopers can pull you over randomly to do inspections on both your uh, tow vehicle and uh, whatever it is that you're towing. Whereas if you get a F-250, they are not, uh, the three quarter tons are not regulated that way. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So you can basically do what you want with them and uh, not have to worry about inspections and DOT regulations and all that kind of stuff. And then one of the cool things is, let me show you the payload on this truck. So the payload on this truck, if you look over here, 2,921 pounds. And that's really good, 2,921 pounds. So that's for the gas. So one other aspect of this is that uh, one of the reasons why I did not get a diesel is because when you get a diesel three quarter ton, it pretty much kills your payload. And the main reason is because those diesel engines are so heavy and they subtract that weight of the engine from the payload of the truck. So honestly, I don't know why anybody would buy a three quarter ton with a diesel in it. The payloads are so low. I think they're like 1,800, 1,900 pounds. It's almost, in the, almost getting close to where the half tons are. So at that point, why even, why even bother with it? To me, if you're gonna get a, a diesel, you might as well go for the 350s and that way you can get uh, a lot better payload. But if you're gonna stick with a uh, 250, I would highly recommend don't get the diesel engine get one with the gas because you're going to get a lot better uh, payload rating and you're going to see uh, how good this truck does towing. Granted, this is only about an 81, 8200 pound trailer, but um, you're going to be pretty impressed on, Ooh, look at that over there. There's Arizona for you. Look at that. You heard these birds going crazy over here and this snake like a sidewinder going across the pavement. That's pretty cool. I don't know where it went. Huh. Anyways, so yeah, um, this Ford Trimmer, talk a little bit about that. In that uh, initially, I was looking over at the uh, Rams. You know, when the Rams came out, I think it's their fifth gen Rams. The interiors on those things are just beautiful beautiful interiors on those trucks and they really had me looking um, and I was really really close to getting one and specifically the power wagon um, but then when I started looking at the power wagon the power wagon even though it's a 2500 they are really really derated um, because of their suspension they don't uh, have very much payload or towing so me and my son were watching TV and we noticed this uh, Ford Tremor video or advertisement come up and immediately it caught my eyes like, what the heck is that? And basically this truck had it all. It had the, you know, the two inch lift, the 35 inch tires, the lockers, um, the, the, high, uh, the high lift running boards on the side, all kinds of goodies that this, this truck comes with. And immediately I was like, well, I think that's it, that's the truck for me. And then I got really lucky with this one because I got it uh, the week before all the dealerships closed down during the pandemic. And I was the last one to basically get a trimmer probably in Arizona. So I've only seen a couple others, but these are pretty rare and hard to find um, trucks. But yeah, so this one has that 7.3 with the, uh, I think it's 430 horsepower and around 470 foot pounds of torque. Does really, really good. Um, again, a lot of the diesel guys are gonna say, well, you should've got a diesel, should've got a diesel, but the only thing I pull is this thing, and this really um, is way more than enough. I'm only pulling, you know, 82, 8,300 pounds. I do have a tractor, but it weighs way less than that. So I don't use this truck um, enough to justify the 10 or $11,000 option that the diesel is gonna be in this truck. So the 7.3, does just fine, especially with that 10-speed transmission. And then like I was saying before, this has a 430 
differential in the back. And a lot of you guys might be worried about a 430 because you think you're going to be revving at you know, 3,000, 3,500 RPM on the interstate. And you guys are going to be pretty surprised uh, when you see me go down the interstate at 75 miles per hour pulling this what the RPM is going to be. Uh, my last video I had some uh, diesel guys commenting that their RPMs were pretty much the same. And then the other thing with the diesel for me is, is that diesel here where I'm at is about between 50 and 80 cents more a gallon. So me getting a diesel, you know, people will brag about the fuel economy, but if the if I'm paying, you know, 70, 80 cents more per gallon, it, it doesn't justify it because ultimately I'm going to be paying more for fuel um, going to a diesel. So this one fit the bill perfectly for me. So yeah, let's get into how we set this trailer up. Hey guys, so this is our 2020 Grand Design 29 TBS. It is 36 foot long, it is a 50 amp, and it has two ACs on top. That's right guys, so one of the things I want to talk to you about real quick is what does this trailer weigh and how much can you put in it? So if I come over here to the side of the trailer and we check this sticker out down here, and if you look at this, up here it's gonna say, the weight of the cargo should never exceed 1,067 pounds. And down here, you're gonna see the gross vehicle weight rating, which was 8,795 pounds. And the unloaded weight rating is gonna be 7,688 pounds. So that's what the trailer is gonna be with absolutely nothing in it or on it. So I would gather to say that the weight of the trailer for us is probably gonna be about 80, 8,100 pounds, maybe 8,200 pounds. And when you're talking about trailers, it's everything that's on them. So I know a lot of us, you know, you throw a lot of stuff up here in front, a lot of wood, things like that to help you level your trailer or wheel chocks, what have you. And then one of the other thing that's a pretty big deal is when you come up here to the front of the trailer, um, you got your propane, up here i've got two propane tanks would add adds a bunch of weight and they're completely full when we leave this front tire that was normally on the back um, but i put it on the front and i'll show you why here in a second but look at this cover here this cover is completely rotted and that's because it sits here in the arizona sun that's only about three months old and look what it's done it's just totally trashed it and these down here are your weight distribution brackets and then these are the big ones so back here i have two marine batteries and those suckers add a lot of weight to the front so generally speaking uh, travel trailers are about 10 to 12 percent of its weight down on the tongue so you figure this is probably about uh, 8,000 pounds 81 8,200 pounds you take 10 percent of that you're looking at it between probably about 800 and 830 840 pounds of down pressure that's on that tongue that's going to be uh, pushing down on the back of the truck. And then real quick, like I said, I put my um, spare tire up here. It just so happens it fit perfectly in there. I put a ratchet strap around the top of it, fit perfectly in between my batteries and my propane tank. And the reason why I did that, and you can see I keep these tire covers on the tires as well because, yeah, Arizona will eat your tires up quick. You come around the back here. That's what the sun does to your head and to your face when you're out in the Arizona sun too long. So spare tire was normally back here and what I did was is I like to take our bicycles with us. So I put this on the back and I know a lot of you are gonna say you never should put a bicycle rack on the back of your trailer because it's gonna basically rip everything apart. And initially um, you'd be right because when I first put this on, this thing started been in this metal on the bumper downward and after four or five trips with these bicycles back here this bicycle rack was basically way over like this and the bicycles were just dangling off the side uh, so what i did was because i have a welder i basically beefed all this up you can see here i put a whole put some angle iron in here and i welded this all on here and then i got another bracket on the back side of this bumper you can't see and basically cinched this in here and welded it all nice and tight, giving it a, a much bigger piece of metal to hang off on because before I had just this receiver hitch welded on to the bottom of this and basically its contact patch was that right there. 
And this thing right here started bending that down and pulling that metal here and pushing it up on the backside, causing this whole hitch to swing back, this bicycle um, carrier to swing back. So when I put this on here, um, it sends strength in that. And I'm about six foot 210, and I can jump up and down on this thing, and it doesn't go anywhere, and it hasn't gone anywhere. So that was the fix for that. And then um, also over here on these brackets in here, I took my welder and actually put some more welds in here just to strengthen them up. And since I did that, uh, I haven't had any issues with this thing moving at all. So I think we're, we're good. But yeah, for you guys that throw these on the back of your trailers, you might want to look into that because uh, I even think it says on here, let me look real quick. I even think it says on here, yeah, if you look at this sticker, it actually says, do not use on trailers or fifth wheel RVs. And I would have to agree with them. It's a pretty good reason not to because this thing was gonna come loose eventually and just basically rip or twist my bumper right in half. But if you know how to uh, engineer a little bit and kind of uh, do some farm, farm working, farm correcting, uh, you guys can figure out a way to, to strengthen that up. Yeah, so enough about that. But yeah, that's our uh, Grand Design 2020. 29 TBS. Hey guys, so one of the things I want to show you as far as uh, your tongue weight goes, obviously I'm not going to take everything out like my propane tanks and everything like that. Um, but I did want to show you at least what the weight distribution hitch weighs, um, the weight distribution bars and maybe a battery. Remember, I do put two of those batteries up there. So all this kind of stuff is going to um, basically make your tongue weight heavier. So let me show you real quick what this weighs. This is the weight distribution hitch tongue. All right, so you can see this weighs almost 59 pounds for that. And we're gonna do these two bars. And these bars are pretty much solid steel. So come back over here, I'll show you what these weigh. So about 27 pounds. So right there you got, we'll just call it 60 plus these, say around 30 pounds. So we'll do about 90, 90 pounds, give or take five pounds. So 90 pounds between the two of these. And then I wanted to weigh this battery right here. This is a deep cycle marine battery. You see on there, that's 50, 56 pounds there. So I carry two of those. So 56 and 56, that's 112 pounds. And then you're over here about 90 pounds. So we'll just call it, uh, we'll just call it rounded up to 200 pounds for two of these batteries and a weight distribution hitch. And then the propane tanks, um, I would gather those probably weigh about Full, I'd probably say those weigh about 40 pounds a piece. So you're looking at probably another, probably another 80 pounds there. So you're looking at probably an extra 280 pounds of tongue weight just on the front. So these things you have to take in consideration when you're towing, because it'll add up really, really quick. And a lot of times these manufacturers, they won't, um, when they give you the tongue weight of these trailers, they a lot of times don't include the, the batteries up front. Um, any weight distribution hitches that you may be using. Of course, those are on a truck, so technically not on a trailer or the propane tank. So just a few things you, you know, take in consideration. And I know with my trailer up front, I got basically all my tools, gear and everything. So I probably have another, I probably have another 100 pounds of gear up in the front of the trailer. And that's a, basically an unloaded trailer. And then when I add everything into it, um, that stuff all adds up. The, the bedroom is in the front, so a lot of our a lot of our clothes and a lot of the stuff we take up there. We have big storage compartment under the bed, so we put a lot of stuff underneath there. So yeah, um, just want to show you how this stuff could add up really quick. All right, so next thing we need to do is get this weight distribution hitch from the floor to the truck. But before I do that, I wanted to show you a couple of things. So this tow bar, when you buy these weight distribution hitches, and this is a Husky weight distribution hitch, when you buy these, um, you can get it with a tow bar or you can uh, get one on by yourself. I had to get one by myself because 
Um, because this is a trimmer and it's got a two inch lift, I needed a bigger drop. So I ended up getting this one. But here's the thing, a lot of these tow bars are two inch tow bars. So you can see this is a two inch. Well, my truck has a two and a half inch receiver. So what I had to do is, is put a, um, a sleeve on here to make this a two and a half. If you come around this side over here, you can see this is a two and a half inch sleeve. And what I did was, is when I first put this on, um, it was rattling, so I welded it in here. And then on the side over here, you can see over here, I put some tack welds up in here. And then I also use this anti-rattle um, device here, and I'll show you how that, that hooks up here in a second. But yeah, so let's get this on the truck. All right guys, so one of the things I wanna show you uh, before we get everything loaded onto the truck is we're gonna measure the squat of the truck. And then once I get everything loaded up, we'll remeasure it so you can kind of see uh, what the truck's doing with and without the weight distribution bar. So we'll set this all up, put the trailer on it, weight distribution, everything loaded, ready to go. Um, and we'll measure the squat. And then when I put the uh, weight distribution bars on it, we'll remeasure the squat so we can see what those uh, bars did as far as lifting the truck back up. But right now, so this is the truck completely unloaded. There's nothing in the back of the bed. And what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna pick this spot just above these lights. You can see these lights are very solid built, so they're solidly mount, so they're not going anywhere. And from the ground to the very edge of this light here, you can see we're about 24 inches and an eighth. Can you see that? 24 inches and an eighth. And just one thing I wanna show you guys real quick, just so you know there's nothing in the bed of the truck. And then uh, also you may see those uh, fifth wheel puck covers. Those are uh, solid metal and I made those. And if you wanna know how I made those, I got a video showing that. So uh, yeah, check that video out too. All right, guys, did a little uh, video magic and the hitch is in the truck now. And trust me, I don't have a computer powerful enough to edit out all the grunts and groans that it took to get that in there. So that's why we skipped that part. But anyways, let me show you uh, what we got going on here. So now that the, the hitch is in there into the receiver, I wanted to show you, see how much right in here, how much play there is. So there's a lot of rattle that goes on in there. So. This thing right here, I got this off of Amazon. They sell them everywhere, but it's an anti-rattle bracket. You can see what it does is it has this little angle right here and it's got this, this metal uh, bar that goes around the bottom. And then what it does is it goes over the top of the, the hitch on the, or the receiver on the truck. And then I cinch these bolts down. I'm gonna show you what that does here. Okay, now that's tightened down. Now look it, no rattle in here at all. There's a little bit down here, which you can't get around from, but once you get the truck, uh, the weight distribution bars on a trailer, this doesn't move at all because it's under extraordinary tension. But you can see this bar up here, look at that. Not, there's no rattle to it at all. So yeah, recommend getting one of these things. It works great, especially if you don't like hearing rattles. Okay guys, the next thing I wanna talk about is taking a uh, generator inverter with you on your camping trips. This is a Predator 3500. We bought this at Harbor Freight. I know a lot of you guys are gonna go, Harbor Freight, why don't you get a Honda or a Yamaha or whatever? Um, truth be known, guys, if you go do some reviews on these, which we did, uh, every camping form, everything, this thing is highly touted. It is basically a Honda clone. Um, we spent around 800 bucks for it, I think. I think it might've been on sale. We might've got a little bit cheaper. Uh, the Honda Yamaha versions are probably gonna be two, three times that. We've taken this out uh, half a dozen times, never had any issues with it. It's just been absolutely perfect. So this is a 3500, it has 3,500 watts of uh, power and it's a uh, 30 amp. So basically what this will allow us to do is that when you're out and you're in your RV and you're boondocking or dry camping, which means basically wherever you're going, you have no hookups, you don't have any water, you don't have electricity, you don't have sewer. Basically you bring everything with you in your trailer. You get an inverter generator like this and allow you to run uh, the AC and your appliances and charge things inside of your trailer. 
Um, the water heater usually runs off of propane, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you did run out of propane, you could switch to electric. You just have to turn your, your AC off and then run this on it. But the other good thing is, is why you want one of these is like even when we're getting ready to head out right now where we're going, we have uh, hookups. However, sometimes the trailer parks, it rarely happens, but the power will go off. Um, just like in Arizona, it's really, really hot. So a lot of people, you know, turn on their ACs and, you know, the power companies will shut the power down or something will happen, a lightning storm or something, you'll lose your power. And now you have a backup. So even when we're going places where we have hookups, we still always take our generator inverter. So when I say generator inverter, just real quick on that. So a generator, you'll see them at the stores, you know, 8,000 watts, 10,000 watts, 20,000 watts and uh, they're usually a lot cheaper, probably half the price of the generator inverters. And when you turn those things on, they run at full wide open throttle the whole time. So whether you're charging a telephone off of it or running your AC off of it, it doesn't matter, they run wide open. And when they run wide open, they're super loud. So they're not really good for camping because you're gonna hear them and they're real loud. They're usually made for people that are in construction and stuff like that, using to run big power tools. They don't care about sound. You take one of those generators out to uh, a camping park or an RV park, and I guarantee you're gonna get plates left and right, and the management's probably gonna tell you uh, to turn it off, and a lot of them will tell you no generators at all. You have to at least have an inverter. So what does the inverter do? So the inverter, what they're designed to do is that they only run enough RPM to run whatever it is that you're pulling out of it. So if I had just got my phone on it, or if I'm sitting inside, I'm just watching the TV, I'm not running the AC or anything. This thing is barely noticeable. It's, it's super, super quiet. And they're designed to be really, really quiet. They got a bunch of insulation on them. The engine's fully enclosed. They're designed for people that are camping. So then I turn on the AC and this thing will ramp all the way up. And even with it at full wide open throttle, it's still gonna be probably half as loud as, if not more than half as loud, than one of a, uh, a regular generator. So that's the reason why these are a little bit more expensive. And the other thing is that's cool with these is that they sip fuel. So you can imagine with a generator, they run wide open throttle. So the, the fuel, you know, they're gonna go through fuel fairly quickly. Whereas these, uh, they just sip. I think I get about, I wanna say 12 hours of runtime on this. And I think it's got a gallon and a half or two gallon tank on it. So it's not, it's not bad at all. And so this thing's been sitting since our last camping trip. Um, which was several months ago. It hasn't been running, so I just wanna show you just how easy this thing, hopefully, or we're gonna to have to retake the video, but hopefully this thing just starts right up. So there you go. And I'm wearing a lapel mic right now. I don't know how much sound this is picking up or not but it is super quiet. And here, I'll walk over here. Okay, so I'm standing over here probably, I don't know, 20 foot away. I'm gonna have the camera pan over to me. So I'm 20 foot away, I'm talking normally. I don't know how much you can hear the recorder or not, or hear from the inverter. Let me walk away a little bit further. So probably another 15 foot, 20 foot. So now I'm gonna walk back over to the inverter so now I'm standing right next to it and I can have a normal conversation and if this was a generator it'd be running wide open all right guys so I was just coming through the Home Depot parking lot in Flagstaff and there's a bunch of RVs in here that are basically dry camping and here is a uh, generator remember earlier I was talking about differences between generators generator inver inverters and just generators where well, here's a 9,000 watt let me let you hear how loud this is let me roll down the window you see I can barely hear myself right now it's how loud those are Yeah, so hopefully that kind of gives you a uh, difference between, well, at least a sound difference between a generator inverter and a straight out generator. That thing is running wide open right now. And if you were in a uh, RV camping park, they would not let you run that.
And one thing I just wanted to show you real quick. So when I first started here a second ago, I actually put it on the wrong uh, dial there. That's why reason why I, I had to push the starter twice. But I just wanted to show you real quick. If I do it, do it. Like I said, it was a couple of months since I last started it. So let's try it. You can see how easy that starts up. So yeah, there you have it on the uh, generator inverters. Highly recommend you taking one of these on your camping trips. Okay, one of the other things I want to touch on real quick, um, this truck does not have the tailgate step in it. You can option these trucks with a tailgate step and basically what happens is that this, the whole step assembly comes out, it drops down, then it has a bar that comes up for you to hold up onto and then you can use it to get up into the, the side of your truck. However, I did not opt to get that. This tailgate does not have that. And one of the reasons why I didn't get it is because when you're pulling a fifth wheel or a travel trailer, what have you, you're gonna have all your you know, your, your hitch assembly, your weight distribution hitch, your trailer jack, everything's gonna be right here. And I'll show you here in a minute when I get this on the, get the trailer on the truck over there, you won't be able to drop your tailgate all the way. You'll get lucky, get it to about this far, but you won't be able to get that step out and you won't be able to get up into your trailer, or sorry, won't be able to get up into the back of your truck easily because you won't have that. So what I did was, is I opted for these side steps. This is uh, made by Amp Research. It pushes down, I actually have one here, and I actually have one back over here. So this one here, once I push it down, I can easily just put a foot up on it. And then I'm up into the truck, and if the, you know, your travel trailer sucked up, or your, you know, your RV or whatever, you can get up into your truck. I mean, normally, yes, I know you could get up on the step, or on the bumper if you wanted to, but the side step makes it a lot easier. And then while I'm up here, uh, I'll show you real quick on how I got the, the generator set up. So on these Fords, you know, the bed is a certain height, certain width, certain length, whatever, but you can see here, this thing fits in here absolutely perfect. This is my Tanu cover up here. And when I close it, you can see it closes perfectly flat with almost no room to spare. There's probably a quarter inch in there before it touches the top. So that ended up being absolutely perfect in there. And then, so this thing weighs, this thing weighs about 110 pounds or so. I think it's 100 pounds, and then when you put the fuel in it, I think it's another 10 pounds of, of fuel that goes into it. So about 110 pounds. That kind of, that adds to your payload too, as far as what the truck's got in it. Um, but I put these two ratchet straps on either side, and you can see it's not gonna go anywhere. And then I have this heavy duty chain that I also chain and lock it in here, just for another added piece of security so I got you know layers of security I got my Tanu cover which locks the tailgate which locks I got this chain on here and then of course you know it's always good to carry chain with you when you're out camping anyway if you get broke down or somebody else gets broke down or you know needs help or whatever it's always nice to have a have a chain along with you but yeah I just want to show you guys that real quick let's move on to the next thing okay guys one of the things I wanted to show you real quick and I did this just for y'all it's kind of a pain, but I wanted to show you the, what the uh, payload was going to be. So the trailer is pretty much loaded up right now. The only thing that I don't have on it is my weight distribution hitch with my tow bars. But I have this way safe hitch you can see here. And that's the hitch that I normally use. That's my normal everyday use um, drop hitch that I use, especially when I pull around my tractor. But one of the cool things that it does is that it tells you how much downward pressure is on that, that hitch. So check this out. Hopefully you guys can see that. It's just a little over a thousand pounds. So that's pretty much right on what we were talking about before when we talked about you know, these two batteries, I got both batteries up here, this spare tire, propane tanks, these brackets, this kind of, my front cargo area is open. You can see I pretty much jam pack everything in there. But yeah, that's pretty much uh, right about accurate. I figure about 840, 850, you know, 830, 40, somewhere around there pounds dry camper. And then when you add all this other stuff, I remember before we were I can't remember what we were at. I think we were like 230, 40 pounds or something. I can't remember what it was, but 
add all that together and you're right about 1100 pounds or so so you can see I'm not going to do the uh, the squat measurement just yet and the reason why is because I want to put my weight distribution hitch on there because that thing weighs that's an aluminum hitch there that thing weighs almost nothing and that weight distribution hitch I think that thing was almost 60 pounds and then those bars were another 20 so that's like or 30 pounds that's almost 90 90 pounds more on there and then I'll uh, do a squat test measurement compared to where we were before and yeah and then I have everything you know loaded up in the back here the heaviest thing is that generator that's about 115 pounds and this cooler is full ice and goodies that thing's probably another geez, man I'd say 80 to 100 pounds I don't know it's pretty heavy let's get a look at the truck right now how it sits so you can see I got a decent squat on it right now so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this out now put that weight distribution hitch on there and then we'll measure the squat compare the difference before we we're at 24 inches and an eighth so we'll see where we're at with the squat this truck's got a 29 2921 pound payload so we're about 1100 right there add probably another 100 on there when I add that other stuff on there so you're probably about 1200 pounds of push down right there then I probably got another you know, propane back there I carry another thing of propane back there five gallon gas tank that generator probably in this thing probably another 300 pounds back there so we figured 1100 pounds up here 300 pounds probably about 1400 pounds 1500 we'll call it 1500 pounds of that weight distribution hitch up in there so about 1500 pounds so you can see this truck does uh, it's got more than enough and then you take me I'm about 200 pounds uh, Stephanie I won't give her weight we'll just say she's a hundred pounds how about that where's she at can she hear me she can't hear me I think she's about I think she's about 140 pounds 130 pounds we'll say 130 I think she's 130 she can't hear me so we won't let her know and if I get in trouble I'll edit this part out so yeah you look at me about 210 her about 130 so you're about 340 my son's going with us he's about 175 so that's 340 440, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So probably another 500 pounds of, called another 500 pounds of people in there. So you add all that together, 1,100, 300, 1,500, another 500 pounds of people, about 2,000 pounds. So about 2,000 pounds total. And that truck is 2921. So I got another 921 pounds of payload that I can go so you can see this truck is perfect uh, for what I need and I believe this truck is rated at about 15,500 bumper pull like this or receiver hitch and I believe it's 18 18,000 or 18,500 for a fifth wheel or gooseneck so that's pretty good I don't pull anything like that like I said I got my little tractor back there and that thing don't weigh anything near what this trailer does so yeah, all right, on to the next thing. Oh yeah, and just real quick before I forget, um, I was talking earlier about that tailgate not being able to go all the way down. So you let your tailgate drop. You see that? See there? It sits right on top of my jack. So if I had the factory step, it'd come out like this. There's no way I'd be able to use it. And you can see right here, to get up in there, that'd be a pain in the butt. So, having that like that, well, that step there makes it much nicer. And then this other one over here I was talking about, it's this little side one. See that? And that lets me get right up there. So you know my generator's right back there, so if I want to turn the generator on or get to it or whatever, I can step right on that and get up in there. And when I'm done with it, let's kick it forward. 
and goes right back in. Yeah, very nice. All right, on to the next thing. All right, guys, here we go. Weight distribution hitch is installed and everything that's gonna be on the truck is on the truck. So you can see the bars are not hooked up yet. So we're gonna measure compared it to what we got before. Last time we checked, it was 24 and an eighth at the top of that light there. And just re real quick on these weight distribution hitches, if you don't have one of these, oh my gosh, they make such a huge difference. I remember when I bought this trailer and I brought it home from a dealership, I did not have a weight distribution hitch. And I only had to drive about 20 miles and I was mostly on the interstate. It wasn't even windy. And I could tell you it was pretty scary, guys. It was swaying. Now, granted, this is my first travel trailer, so I didn't have a lot of experience with it, but it was pretty bad. I couldn't do the speed limit. Speed limit on the interstate is uh, 75. I was probably doing 60. It was swaying really good. You know, was, I was already thinking, oh man, I can't believe, am I gonna be able to do this? Cause I feel like it's dangerous. But I already had that weight distribution hitch on order and it was uh, only a couple days out from getting to the house. And I can tell you this, once I installed this, and again, this is the uh, Husky Centerline series. And you can see what it's, you can see what it's rated for right here. Uh, looks like 12,000 pounds. You can do a 6,000, an 8,000, a 12,000 pound. And this trailer is about 8,000, so we got we got a lot the a lot of leeway on there. But anyway, so not only does this hitch redistribute the weight back into the truck, it's kind of the best way I can explain. It. It's kind of like a wheelbarrow. If you look at those right there, they're like wheelbarrow arms and they're lifted up when I put this under tension and it kind of twists that hitch that way whereas normally like right now all the weight is on that hitch and it's pushed down this way. When those bars have the torsion it's going to twist them and torsion that whole hitch basically back into the truck and it puts weight back onto the front axle. It makes the truck ride much much better so instead of all the weight being back here it distributes it across the truck. And then the other thing that it does, and this is a big one, is not only does it do the weight distribution, but it also does the anti-sway. And the way that it does that is because these bars basically are gonna go up into this bracket up here, and I'll show you that here in a second. Um, creates a tremendous amount of friction in here because there's so much downward pressure on these when it's all tensioned up that it keeps the, basically keeps the sway from happening. It locks the thing together, it locks the truck and the, and the trailer together. So it knocked out 95% of the sway that I had. So it made this truck feel, truck and trailer combo feel so completely different, 100% safe. I could do the speed limit, pass 18 wheelers, go around turns, it didn't matter. It just 100% different. So if you don't have one of these, you gotta get one. I think it should almost be the law that you should have one. I mean, it's crazy the difference between the two. So yeah, all right, let's get into this uh, measurement here real quick. All right, guys, so I just want to show you how you uh, put these bars on. So the way that you do it, the only way that you can do it, is you basically have to use this trailer jack and jack up your truck and the trailer together in order to get these bars to lift. And then you use this tool to basically leverage them up on there. So let me show you this real quick. See everything's coming up together. Pulls the whole back of the truck up. Pulls the trailer up. All right, I think that's high enough. So I'm gonna come around to the other side to show you, show you how we do this. So you can see this tool here, the way that works there. And then you try to get this as close as you can. You take this tool, you basically 
hook that up there like that, and you can see how that's going to help you there. And then you bend with the knees, at the back, pop that thing up on there. So you can see the incredible amount of tension that's going to be on there. And then you got to do the same thing on the other side. All right, there you go. So now that you got those both up on there like that, you have to layer, lower the, the jack back down. So now we're gonna let this down. I think next time I should have Stephanie do this. Put her back into it a little bit. All right, so there you can see, Jack is off the wood here. I'll raise it up a little bit more. You know, earlier I was talking about that, the rattle from the hitch. So now you can kind of see and understand how much tension there is on that bottom piece. So before we had a little bit of rattle in here, but with that tension in there, it's got this thing so torsion and twisted, you know, with all that weight going back in there, all that tension going back into the truck. You can see there's no, there's no rattle at all. All right, so here we go. Um, we're gonna do the, uh, the measuring. If you remember last time we first started when a truck was unloaded, it was uh, 24 inches and an eighth. And then when we loaded everything on it, we dropped uh, down to 20 inches. Actually, I think it was about 19, just a tad, a little tad under 20. So let's see where we're going to be at. All right, so looks like we're about 21 and 3 eighths, 21 and a quarter. So we were, we were up here 24, and we went down to here with the weight distribution on there. With no weight distribution, we were we were down here. So we gained about an inch and a quarter with the weight distribution hitch on there. And come over here, let's see what the truck looks like. So the truck, back down here and check the squat. So, you know, from a factory, the trucks have about a three inch rake on them. So you figure right now it's setting pretty much level. I lost about three inches altogether. Weight distribution brought me up about an inch and a quarter. You can see the truck looks real good right there. That makes all the difference in the world. Let's go look at my leaf packs. Check out that overload. And you can see there I got a long ways to go. So yeah, there you have it. That's pretty much uh, set up, ready to roll out. We're gonna be heading to uh, Flagstaff, about a 300 mile trip. And also, um, the weather was gonna be like 115 to 118 in Phoenix, but it's since cooled down. It's probably only gonna be about 108 driving through there. And we're at, it's gonna be about 100, 103. So it's, it's cooled down quite a bit. You can see we got a little bit of an overcast. Maybe some rain clouds moving in. It won't be as hot as I expect. It's still going to be pretty hot, but just not scorching hot. It'll still be a good test for the truck and the, uh, the engine, and the tires, and the transmission, and all that good stuff. Oh, also, these back here. So these, I have a tire pressure monitoring system. And they're called uh, tire minders, made by Tire Minder. And basically, what those do is it monitors not only the the pressure in the tires, but it also monitors the heat in the tires. And then I have a, a monitor that goes inside the cab of the truck that um, basically tells me in real time what they're at. And then I have alarm set so if they get too hot or too much pressure, because as, as these things get hotter, the pressure is going to go up. 
substantially. And you have to keep, keep an eye on that, especially when you're on a real hot pavement, real hot temperatures like up in Phoenix. If you get into trouble, you can pull over and let them cool down before you get a blowout. Because when these things blow, I've seen them rip, just rip entire trailers apart. All that rubber comes loose and just, man, destroy a trailer. So I, I don't want that to happen. And also, these tires are uh, Goodyear endurance tires. And initially, this trailer came brand new uh, with some pretty crappy tires. I can't remember the name of them, but everybody called them China Bombs. They're basically the cheapest tires that could be put on a trailer and everybody was having problems with them uh, destroying themselves and these tires were highly recommended these good years so I pretty much put these on right from the beginning give me a little extra peace of mind so those are basically uh, four brand new tires that went on this thing probably within two weeks of me owning this trailer matter of fact I got them before my first trip because I didn't even want to have to worry about blowing tires Hey guys, we're getting ready to leave on our trip. Let me take you inside to show you how we secure the inside of the RV as we're traveling. Come on, let me show you. So I start back here in the bunk area. Um, just kind of let you know what we do as far as the stuff that we bring along and to make sure that as we're traveling down the road, nothing is falling over. Uh, so we travel with our dog, Pepper. Maybe you'll meet her later in the video. Uh, we bring her crates fans, extra stuff. So we just kind of secure it on the, around the bunks, make sure that, like I said, nothing falls as we're traveling. Doors, we make sure all the doors are latched throughout the RV. They come with this latch right here, um, just to make sure they don't slide as we're traveling, you know, banging against the wall. The same thing in the kitchen, we just make sure all the cabinets are closed, um, secured, just to make sure they're not opening and sliding as we're, again, going down the road. Um, that goes for all the cabinets. Again, just to make sure they're secure and they're not popping open. The same thing back here in the bathroom. We just kind of make sure all the cabinets are closed. Again, the door is latched to make sure it doesn't slide back and forth as it's going down the road. And the same thing back here in our bedroom. Um, just make sure all the cabinets are closed. And the same thing with the door, make sure it's latched so it's not sliding back and forth. And there's also one more thing after we go through the RV, kind of check to see how the, making sure everything is secured. The last thing we do is to bring in the slide. This is our slide, we just bring it in and just double check everything, make sure we have everything. And yeah, that's it. That's just pretty, pretty simple. All right guys, so we're inside the truck and before we depart, just wanted to show you the tire minder up here. You see what's going on there gives me my tire pressure all four tires and then if I hit this button here it's going to tell me the temperatures of all four tires and you'll see this left side is a little bit hotter right now because that's the side that's facing towards the Sun and as we get going and moving these tires are going to heat up and we'll see how hot they get so we're getting ready to part right now I got my son with me here and I got Stephanie and the dog in the back. And yeah, that's our dog. And yeah, we're getting ready to roll. So let's get started.
Okay guys, we're just getting up on the road right now. We're on Interstate 10. And if you look over at the navigation here, according to Google, we got four hours and four minutes, 279 miles. And we're probably about 10 or 15 miles away from getting our first gas. I need to fill up first. And like I was telling you guys before, um, I am gonna hand calculate that. So as soon as we get to the gas pumps, I'll fill up the, basically the gas tank all the way to the, to the neck. We can actually see the fuel getting ready to come out of it. And then we'll start from there and uh, we'll go as far as I can go before I need to get gas again. And then once I get gas again, we'll fill it right back up to where it's almost overflowing. And then basically we'll divide um, the amount of miles that I went in between Phillips by how many gallons that I got. And that will give us the most accurate mile per gallon reading. So yeah, on to the next clip. Okay guys, so I just want to show you real quick. I know I say that a lot in the videos, real quick. Hopefully it is real quick. But anyway, so I'm going down the interstate right now. I'm doing 70 miles per hour. And my RPM is about 1900. So let me look at, let me show you the gauge over here. And you can see the RPM. We're doing about 1900 RPM. We're doing 70 miles per hour right now, going down the road. So remember earlier we were talking about having a 430 gear in there and how some of you might be concerned going down the road um, you know revving really high because you got that real low gear in the back so that's not the case and as we get out of this traffic in here and we get we're just still outside of Tucson we're still heading to go get gas but once we get outside of this traffic um, and we get out on some more um, open roads I'll put the speed up to about 75. That way you guys can see what it's getting at 75 miles per hour as far as RPM. It usually gets right around 2,000 RPM. Okay, so we're going down a road right now at 70 miles per hour. The RPM is 1,900. Let me show you the gauge over here. You can see that, 1,900 RPM, 70 miles per hour, and I'm in 10th gear going down the road at 70 miles per hour. And I know, um, like we were talking about before, some of you might be concerned that having those 430 gears you're going to rev real high on the interstate or higher um, but with this 10 speed that just ain't the case and later on when I get out more on the open roads I'll put the speed up to about 75 and you can see I'll probably do about 2,000 rpm at 75 miles per hour pulling this trailer um, and usually it'll be between 8th and 10th gear so yeah on to the next clip all right guys so here we go getting ready to get gas coming over here to the pilot right now. You zoom in on the gas prices over there, 271. So here's a perfect example of why I was saying I don't like to get diesel. So look at the diesel price up there, $3.45. And it's 271 for unleaded. So that just goes to you know what I was saying before on how if I lived in the right market, diesel might make more sense but you know everybody touts about the better fuel mileage but if you're paying that much more for diesel it really doesn't do you any good where I'm at. I know some of the other parts of the country that works real well just not here in my area. Alright so getting ready to pull into the gas station over here. Looks like I'm gonna be waiting for a minute. I got a little bit of a line here. All three bays are all three bays are full. And I got here's one thing that annoys me, guys, you'll see is you'll get people not pulling trailers that are in the RV fueling only, which is always fun. So instead of them going over here where you got pumps that are open, they'll do this. So yeah, that's always fun. Gas pump courtesy. All right guys, so we just, we just got gas and I filled it all the way up 
don't know if you can see it in there or not. I actually filled it up enough to where I can see the gas in there. You might not be able to see it, but I got it filled up so I can see it. So that way, the next fuel I get, I'll fill it up to the same level. And then uh, we'll do our calculation. Sorry, I got a bunch of diesels going by me over here. Very loud. That's what I got right now. 25, basically 25 gallons of gas. All right, back on the road. All right guys, so we're about 75 miles under the trip. Let me show you the gauge over here. We're getting about seven miles to the gallon. Um, our RPM is about 2,500. I'm in eighth gear, and I'm doing just a little under 70 miles per hour right now. And the reason why is because uh, traffic's been pretty heavy, but the wind is really bad right now. Um, but if you look to the top right, you're gonna see it says 219 degrees. That's my transmission temperature. And a lot of you might think, and look, we'll look out here real quick and look at the terrain. It's starting to rain a little bit. Traffic's pretty heavy. Anyway, so a lot of you might think uh, 219 degrees, actually I just hit 221 right now, it's pretty hot. And normally you'd be right, when I first got this truck, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, something's wrong with my transmission. It's running really hot. Um, and I did some research on it. And of course this transmission was new for 2020, so you know a lot of people going on the forearms had the same trucks with the 7.3 and the and the 10 speed well actually the 7.3 doesn't matter because the diesel's got the 10 speed too but a lot of us were really concerned because um, the transmission temps seemed to be running really high so after some research um, I found out that these and this has been beat to death on the internet forums and everything so it's it's pretty much been all worked out for 2020 Ford redesigned those transmissions and they also uh, came up with a new it's a UVL transmission fluid and it's only used in these 10 speeds and it's designed these transmissions are designed to run hot pretty hot and they do it for efficiency so it running at 221 225 degrees I've seen it run up to 235 degrees would freak most people out but it's absolutely perfectly normal for these trucks to run the transmissions hot. And if you, I'm gonna show you over on the gauge real quick again. So if you look at the gauge, it says 219. If you look at the bar underneath it, you'll see it's right in the middle. And on some of the older trucks, if you were running 219, you'd probably be three quarters hot on that, that bar graph down there. Whereas you can see 217, 219, I'm right, I'm right in the middle. So, yeah, other than that, I pretty much got the truck set in cruise control right now. Um, 2,500 RPM, I'm in eighth gear. Truck is doing absolutely fine. It is really windy out, so I'm just keeping the speeds down a little bit just because I don't give myself a little extra time unless in case something was to happen. A lot of 18-wheelers out, but we're probably about uh, another 20 minutes outside of Phoenix and uh, probably another I don't know, maybe 80 miles, 70, 80 miles for my first fill up, fill, fuel up. And that's when we'll do the uh, hand calculation to see exactly what we're getting. So right now we're getting seven miles per gallon, like I was saying. I've done this trip before and the, the truck will say I'm usually getting about eight to eight and a half. Uh, but like I was saying, I'm going into a really good headwind right now. Um, it's raining, looks like it's raining probably about 20 miles in front of me and it's pushing a lot of that cool air towards me, which is causing a lot of wind. It's only 91 degrees right now, and usually, you know, going through Phoenix at this time of year, you'd already be 110, 115 degrees, so. All right, so we're getting into Phoenix. We're at 120 miles right now, averaging 7.2 miles per gallon, and its uh, transmission is 216 degrees. Engine temperature is 189 degrees. 
It's only 83 degrees outside right now, guys. So it looks like it rained pretty good coming here to Phoenix, which is it's pretty rare. I know uh, initially we thought it was going to be around 110 to 115 up here, which it would have been normally, but this rain has really cooled things down out here, which is pretty nice. Um, it's kind of made it uh, nice driving out through here too, because I don't have to worry about the, the scorching heat. My tire pressures right now are all about 86 pounds, and my temperatures in my tires are around 90 degrees, is what I'm running at right now. So we're gonna head to Cords Lake on the way to Flagstaff. That's where our next uh, fueling station is at. That's probably another, uh, I don't know, 45, maybe 50 miles from here. So yeah, that, that'll be our next, our next stop. All right, guys, we're at 153 miles right now, and we're, our average went up a little bit. I'm at 7.5 miles per gallon. And from here on up, we're on I-17, just outside of uh, Phoenix, heading towards Flagstaff. <clears throat> and from here on, it's pretty much gonna be uphill all the way. You can see our transmission temperatures are about 214 degrees. Engine temperature is 196 degrees. And I'm running at almost 70 miles an hour and I'm in uh, eighth gear right now and a while back ago I remember uh, in one of my videos somebody was talking about the transmission temperature can't be hotter than the tran the transmission temperature couldn't be hotter than the engine temperature well there you go right there it's 212 degrees on the transmission and 198 degrees on the engine so That'll debunk that. And so what I noticed is that my transmission temperature will go from like 208, it'll go up to like 223, 226, and it'll drop back down to 210. It'll go back up to 226, 225, 221. Kind of goes up and down, up and down, and uh, fluctuates. And what I'm thinking is, is uh, there's probably some type of like a thermostat or something inside the transmission that's opening and closing, and that's how it's regulating its heat, or it's it's doing it by, <clears throat> you know, some computer-controlled valve or something in there. But I'm thinking that's how Ford regulates the heat in a transmission. But it does like to stay up there in those, you know, upper teens to low to mid 20s as far as uh, heat goes. Again, that's because you know the, the, the hotter the oil, uh, the more liquid it is, makes it the more you know the viscosity, less viscosity, and uh, flows better through through the transmission, which in turns make it more efficient. So I'm thinking that's why Ford did what they did is they're trying to make these bigger trucks a little bit more fuel efficient than than what they've been in the past. So yeah, we got about another um, 20 miles or so. 15, 20 miles before we hit the Cords Lake, and that's where we get our first fill up. All right, so going up this hill right here, um, I'm gonna maintain 55 miles per hour. Let me show you over here on the gauge in a cluster here. So I'm about 3,500 RPM, and it's in fifth gear, and it's maintaining 55 miles an hour going up this hill. And I like to just set the cruise control when I'm going up these hills, look in, look in front of us here. See these 18 wheelers right here? So I gotta slow down. I gotta come off the cruise control to brake because they're having a hard time getting up these hills. Then I'll hit resume. Okay, come back over to the gauge. So I just hit resume right there. You can see how easy the speedometer goes right back up to speed that I need to get to. Maintain 55. Like I said, I like to do the cruise control mainly because um, 
the engine and transmission combo just do so much better when it knows where you want to be at. Because I notice without the cruise control, there seems to be a pretty big delay when I hit the gas. I got to keep pushing and pushing before it'll downshift or before it'll, you know, get moving. And kind of the same thing while uh, braking. So if you ever watch TFL, which I do, they're one of my uh, favorite YouTube channels, but they do that Ike Gauntlet test. And what they do is they count the amount of brakes um, that they have to do to, to slow the vehicle down. I think it's from 65. It gets over that going downhill. And what I've found is, is that if you just put the cruise control on, um, the truck will downshift for you and engine brake, and this truck does engine brake. It's not an exhaust brake like a diesel, but it will engine brake. So hopefully I'll get to show you here shortly, but if you just leave your cruise control on and let it do its thing, it'll hold that speed, maintain that speed, go through the gears, it'll do everything way more efficiently and quicker than you will. So going downhill, you know, I'll have the cruise control set at whatever, you know, 55, 65, and it'll hold that going down. It won't speed up, and I won't ever even have to uh, touch the brake. Whereas if I didn't have it on cruise control, then the, the truck doesn't know what I want it to do. So it doesn't, you know, know does it want to coast or does it want to speed up or does it want to slow down or, or what have you. But, yeah, so if you have one of these newer trucks with this 10 speed. I don't know how the previous trucks did with the, the six speeds, but um, these 10 speeds with the 430 gear, 7.3 liter gas, just put it in cruise control, let it figure it out. It does a really good job because otherwise, you know, you're just getting frustrated because you constantly be pushing down on that gas a lot. So yeah, hopefully I get to show you here a good downhill here in a second, show you how it'll hold its, uh, hold its gear going down. All right, guys, so right now I'm doing 70 miles per hour. If you come down and look at the gauge, you can see I'm right at about 4,000 RPM, holding 70 miles per hour. That's where my cruise control is set at. And it makes all of its power at about 4,000. And if you go back, you come up to the road here, um, you'll see this is a 6.5% descent one mile ahead so we're going to kind of pay attention to this over here and show you how this uh, engine braking is going to work okay so it says trucks vehicles pulling trailers check brake equipment one fourth mile and then if you see this thing on the, the right over here it says brake check area in blue and i'm actually going to slow my cruise control down to 60 because i know this area and it's a little curvy in here, so I'm gonna go down to 60 miles per hour, set my cruise control. You see these signs up here, six and a half, next seven miles. So this would be a good, good time to show you. So the sign right here, it says truck vehicles pulling trailer, use lower gears, runaway truck ramp to two and a quarter mile. You can see how steep this is out here. And Right now I'm at 60 miles per hour. Here, if you come over to the gauge. I'm at 60 miles per hour, I'm in 10th gear. I'm going down a 6.5% grade. And then I just went to 8th gear. Now see it's speeding up to 63. My foot's still completely off the brake. It just downshifted to 6th. Now it just downshifted to 5th. Now it just downshifted to 4th and it's slowing down 62 miles per hour. So if you look at my RPM, I'm about 4,500 RPM. It just slowed me right back down to 60. And if you look at this grade that we're on, it's very, very, very steep. And still holding at 60 miles per hour. It's not speeding up. And if you didn't have your cruise control set you would have to either hold the brake or downshift yourself and this is kind of like what I was saying how TFL tests their trucks on when they go downhill like this they don't set the cruise control so the truck has no idea what speed you want it to be at so it just kind of speed just creeps up creeps up and you know it just uh, it'll get away from you so if you come back over here to the gauge 
again. So still holding right at 60 miles per hour. I'm in fourth gear, 4,500 RPM, dead set at 60 miles an hour without my foot. I don't know if you can look down to my foot. You can see my feet, not on the brake, not on the gas, not on the brake. Come back up to the, the road here. Pan out there across that valley over there. Look at that. That's a runaway truck ramp over there on the left. Elevation 4,000 foot. Still holding right at 60 miles per hour. And I, I could set this at 50, 55, 70. I could set it at whatever and it, it'll hold the speed. It just, uh, I like doing 60 through here because like I said, it's a little curvy through here and I don't want my speeds to be too high. So 60 is about perfect. So yeah, on to the next clip. All right guys, we made it to our first fuel station. You see the gas prices up here, $2.99 for gas, $3.53 for diesel. And so let's see what we got. So we've got 188 miles exactly. And we got 7.1 miles per gallon average. So all right, let's get some gas and we'll see how accurate this mile per gallon calculator is. All right guys, so I just filled up the fuel tank all the way to the, to the neck here. You probably can't see it. Well, it's actually gone down just a little bit, but I got it all filled up in there. It took me probably an extra two minutes waiting for it to go up and down, up and down before I finally got it up there. But I did that on the last fill up too. So we've got 188 miles. If you come over here to the fuel gauge here on what we got. So I put in 27.042 gallons. 27.042 gallons, we went 188 miles. So now let me go to the calculator here. So we'll do 188 divided by 27.042 equals 6.952. Around that to seven. 6.952 around that to seven. And my truck readout was 7.1. So that's not bad. I mean, you think about all that up and down, going up the hills, the descents, um, heavy towing, and it's within 0.1 of a gallon. So I think that did pretty good. So I will do one more um, calculation from here. And this one will be a little bit different because I only got about another 70 miles to go before I unhook the trailer. And then the rest of the driving will just be the normal driving around. But the uh, next time I fuel up, we'll calculate from here um, and the next fuel up to see if it kind of stays within the same uh, accuracy or not. All right, guys, so just showing you the truck working again. Here we are, we're doing 70 miles an hour if you come over to the gauge. 70 miles an hour, we're basically, feels like we're going straight uphill. Uh, I'm hanging out about 4,500 RPM. Like I was saying before, it pretty much makes all of its torque right at about 4,000 to 4,500 RPM. So it'll like to hang out there when it's really starting to work. But if you look at the transmission temperature, it's uh, 230 degrees. 230 degrees, engine temperature is 214 degrees. And I've been going up this incline for probably 10 minutes. And it just went up to sixth gear. It wasn't fourth gear before that. Um, and now I'm at 232 degrees, and you would think that that would, you know, an older transmission, you'd be ready for that thing to explode, getting that kind of heat into it. Well, not explode, but it'd be really, really hot, whereas this thing, no issues at all. And yeah, I'm at 234 still right now. So yeah, I just 
kind of want to show you how the transmission uh, gets up to these high temps. I think that's probably the highest I'll get up to is about 234, 208 on the engine temperature. All right, guys, here we are. We are at our camp spot, Woody Mountain Campground, Flagstaff, Arizona, off of Route 66. And while we're here, we're gonna make a couple other videos. One of them is gonna be a review of this, kind of a walk around review of this campground. It's probably our sixth time being here. And then Stephanie is going to do a review of our RV. So you guys stay tuned for those two videos, but yeah, here we go. Everything is good to go. I got to check in, get our camping spot. Got the dog here. She's excited. She's excited. Look at her. She can't help herself. All right, here's our camping spot. Woody Mountain Campground, Flagstaff, Arizona. Not bad. I just got gas again and this time I'm completely unloaded you see I got no trailer there so we're gonna fill up I'm still in Flagstaff and we're getting ready to head to uh, Grand Canyon Arizona so I filled the truck up to the neck just like I did before so we can get an accurate reading I'll do this one more time and see how accurate the mile per gallon calculator a truck is when we're unloaded so the next time I get gas we'll um, fill up to the neck again and then hand calculate okay guys I just want to give you an update on my mileage come over here and look at the gauge here so this is my unloaded mileage and I've gone, I've gone 150.9 miles and I'm getting 15 miles per gallon average and basically going uphill, downhill, going from uh, Flagstaff to the Grand Canyon. And now we're on our way back to Flagstaff and kind of show you the terrain a little bit. We're going through. We're averaging probably, averaging probably between 60 and 70 miles per hour. Yeah, that's what I got so far. guys here we are back at the campsite we have gone 206 miles up to the Grand Canyon the Flagstaff to the Grand Canyon and now back I got 14.9 miles hours per gallon I was actually at 15 and as I pulled in here I went to 14.9 but yeah so 14.9 well we'll call it 15 15 miles per gallon average over 206 miles all right guys so here we are going to get gas again and this time we've gone 306 miles and i've averaged 13.3 miles per gallon and this 306 has pretty much been uh, we went to the grand canyon and back flagstaff to grand canyon and back and the rest has all been city driving so one thing about this 13.3 which i still feel is pretty good um, I had a lot of idling time in there, probably about two hours of idling time. Um, we were sitting in various areas where I was doing some drone footage and stuff like that and walking a dog around a truck and my son was playing with the drone, doing a bunch of things. I 
had quite a bit of idling time, which actually dropped me probably a good, I'd say almost a mile per gallon because prior to us doing a lot of idling time, I was about 14.5, 14.6 miles per gallon. So the idle time dropped me down quite a bit. But we are gonna hand calculate again. So I'm at the gas pumps. We're gonna hand calculate one more time. Oh, and here's another thing I wanted to show you. So up here in Northern Arizona, remember how I showed you the diesel price to gas where I'm at, Southern Arizona, wasn't worth it. But see up here, it would be, because look at that. Diesel's 325, unleaded is 325. So if I lived up here, maybe I would have considered a diesel. And I've even been to some places uh, like Pine Top, Arizona, where the where diesel's like 20 cents cheaper than gas. But yeah, let me get this gas and um, hand calculate this and see how accurate the uh, mile per gallon calculator is going to be on this one. All right, stand by. All right, guys, here you go. So I got 23.269 gallons and come back over here on 306.7 miles and 13.3 miles per gallon average. So let's do the let's do the math on that. 306.7. Get this glare off of here. Divided by 23.269. 23.369. Two six nine equals thirteen point one eight. Thirteen point one eight. Round that up to thirteen point two. This had me at thirteen point three. I would say that was pretty accurate. I did fill up the gas to the neck, so that was the same same variable. So yeah, I would say this did pretty good, guys. I mean, I was within one tenth of a gallon on the last fill up too, and like I said, I had a lot of idling time, and it still accounted for that and gave me within one tenth of a gallon. So I know some guys were thinking that the mile per gallon calculator might be off, but I think it's pretty safe to say that this seems to be fairly accurate, at least on these 2020s, or at least on my truck anyway. And yeah, I don't think there'll be a need to hand calculate anymore. I'll just remember I'm within one tenth of a gallon. So yeah, there you have it guys. All right guys, I just wanted to do a little short video. We're coming in, we're coming back from Flagstaff back to Vail, but we're driving through Phoenix right now, and the temperature is 112 degrees, and it's 11.46 and we're doing 65 miles per hour. We have been doing, probably been averaging about 70, 72, but you can see through Phoenix, it's kind of a lot of traffic going on, but if you look at the transmission temperature, 212 degrees, engine temperature is 198. AC's blowing, so it's uh, very nice and cool inside of the truck. See the trailer still back there. And let me go over to the miles per gallon. So there's the mile per gallon. That's over 140 miles. You get 8.6. And I think going the other way, I think I was around seven, but. Um, like I said, going the other direction, going to Flagstaff, it's a lot of uphill, a lot more uphill, whereas you got more downhills coming this way. And then from Phoenix to Tucson, it's pretty flat all the way there. But yeah, I just wanted to show you guys uh, what it's like when it's really hot out. And I know when I was coming up here, it was raining and kept it cool, so I wasn't able to do that. So I'll have to edit this video in somehow. I apologize if it's going to be out of sequence, but... I did want to show it to you. All right, there you have it, guys.